Kevin, welcome to the Home Dow Podcast. Hey, man. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for making the trip all the way down here to, in order to make this happen. So, super excited. I love it down here. Do you? Yeah. Really? Really cool. Yeah. Coming from good California, vibe. you love it in Texas. The, uh, yeah. The heat is uh, typically dissuades a lot of people, but uh, for coming from perfect weather to, uh, to a little warm, but yeah, awesome. Yeah. The people... That's the, the main thing is the people. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the weather is, of course, important, but I'm, uh, I'm most excited about you guys, you know, you and Deke. Um, Deke was just on for mm-hmm. the second episode. Yeah. And we covered a lot about his background, about CLS, about the home DAO. And it's good getting the other co-founder to now be able to share a very similar trajectory, but from a new lens, from a new perspective. Right. Um, so this is super exciting. I want to read out uh, Kevin Warren's background for you guys. We'll be talking about solar energy, EPC, and so much more. So he's co-founder and COO of CLS Sustainable, multinational solar developer and EPC with over 35 years of energy experience, specializing in CNI, utility, and community projects. Kevin has originated, designed, and or engineered over 155 megawatts of photovoltaic installations, ranging from small commercial to utility scale projects throughout Texas, Cali, Colorado, North Carolina, Illinois, Ohio, Florida, Massachusetts, Maryland, and DC. And CLS most recently came on board as developers of HomeDAO, which unifies the best people, ideas, systems, and funding and sustainability, bringing real world assets to Web3. So you can find the clssustainable.com link in the bio below. Also, Kevin's LinkedIn profile if you want to connect with him there and all the home DAO links. Kevin, let's blast off with your journey in energy. Take us through that. My journey in energy. Uh, so I went to school for electrical engineering. Um, and coming out of that, I... Uh, I wanted to find a space in in either energy or just in the engineering field that um, I thought was on the forefront. I, I wanted something cutting edge, something that was on the upswing. Um, so through that, I took off to Colorado, northern Colorado, Paonia, to... Um, go to Solar Energy International, which is kind of uh, just this, at, at that point, it was just this like kind of little commune style school that um, very few people attended because solar energy was so expensive and so difficult to, uh, to make um, financial sense of. So went up there, uh, did my first training in solar energy, um, Came back to Texas, kind of uh, started tracking what exactly I wanted to do. Uh, got on a couple of rooftops through my first solar panels and uh, figured a few things out. Um, and then met my wife um, here. And one day, I guess maybe a little while after we started dating, I said I, I wanted to go all in. Um, in the solar field so we moved to Durango uh, and uh, I think we had talked about it earlier we, we bought a 1964 uh, Airstream and gutted it and turned it into you know a complete off grid and we found this little spot of land um, on the river there and uh, yeah so I would commute up to SEI um, for a week every month for the first five months we were there to do my NABSEP training and um, she would hang out in our, uh, in our trailer with our two cats and our two dogs and uh, not, a much, not a lot of space but um, so from there <clears throat> you know you start you start you start seeing where this is gonna go uh, as far as the the energy side of this and by the time I <clears throat> started throwing actual panels and making any money doing this, and caveat that it wasn't a lot of money, you know, we still had to bartend on the weekends and things like that. There was no, there was no full-fledged <clears throat> solar uh, 
career at that point. It was it was almost a hobby uh, that that you made money elsewhere, and um, it was a labor of love for sure, uh, and not a labor of you know financial sense really. So, um, but we could see that there was a wave coming. Yeah. Module prices, energy production prices, the way that we were producing energy was starting to drastically fall. We were installing at nine, ten dollars a watt at one point, and now we're coming down to being able to sell this stuff at about four fifty. And obviously now, you know, we're down in, in, in the CNI utility space where we're down in the dollar fifty range in, in certain markets and, so cool. and even lower yeah. elsewhere. So, so I really thought that. Maybe I was on the on the front, you know, uh, and maybe on the front of of a big upswing in this new uh, this newer energy uh, production field, and uh, obviously we had the we had the feeling that if we were gonna make a lot of money, that's fine, but we want to make money. And feel great about it. Um, we have kids now, but you know, at that point, they were just a plan in the future, or maybe a thought. But whatever we did, uh, and I always say we because I, my wife and I going to work as a team. So, um, but whatever that venture was, just wanted to make sure that uh, we left. We didn't make a lot of money harming our children's future. So came up with this idea of doing well by doing good and uh great and just rolled with it man yeah. and uh it's been it's been like a 12 year adventure in, in in the solar industry and i've seen um i've seen massive trade shows like like solar power international and things like that go from just you know 30 of us getting drunk in vegas to now there are just thousands of people there and it's just uh, grown hundredfold Whoa. since we were first in it, um, but you know it's it's just been uh, it's been it's been a wild ride, and I think we're finally at this point where we've set the table to to a point that uh, some major major things can happen in the next several years. Um, we got through. A lot of difficult times, um, and watch this entire field change. So yeah. it's uh, exciting, man. But in not so much of a nutshell, that's my that's, that's my cool. history in the uh, <laughs> in renewable energy. So yeah, I love when you're sharing. There was this um, this draw, in a sense, to solar at such a like a young uh, place in its trajectory. In mm-hmm. such an early time, and then to sort of uh, to actually get up, do installs at when it wasn't even making that much financial sense necessarily, right? And then to see over time photovoltaic efficiency increase, um, to see the price of production decrease, mm-hmm. to see the price per watt of energy decrease so much, um, and to see these conferences go from 30 of you guys to yeah. thousands. Mm-hmm. Um, this is so cool that the time is totally now and that you it's been a labor of love. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there, there have been doubts throughout, <laughs> down the road. Uh, yeah, we definitely, I have definitely doubted myself several times in this industry, but, uh, you know, we stuck with it. And, and uh, like you said, the time is definitely now. Uh, I, I think we're definitely hitting the precipice of, of where it's just going to make so much financial sense in so many different markets. And, um, yeah, I, I think Home Dow is only going to help that, you know, explosion. So. Yeah. Let's hit this um, from what you ended up um, building with Deke. Mm-hmm. So you guys built uh, CLS Sustainable. Mm-hmm. So Deke kind of gave us a nice uh, perspective on that. We'll also link um, the episode two with Deke in the bio of this video and we'll link episode three um, in Deke's video Mm -hmm. um, so you guys can get a nice perspective on uh, CLS from both of their angles. 
So then how did CLS blossom and how could you also like kind of recap it in its essence? Sure. Yeah. The uh, CLS came to about, uh, came, came to be, um, my wife was tired of living in a mountain town and, and thought, uh, let's, let's get back to our roots, which was Dallas Fort Worth and uh, be around the family a little bit more and uh, obviously we were, we were at the point where we were going to decide to have kids and wanted them to be around grandma and grandpas and and all so we we moved back here um the texas market was it, 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 as far as cni is concerned it was just not not exactly flourishing um the energy cost in the state of texas is very very low in most cases and uh kind of difficult to make some of the cni stuff pencil so um, I was still consulting back um, Colorado, California, Nevada, New Mexico, Arizona, those markets, and um, I ran across a, 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 a they had they had hired a, a headhunter basically to to go out and look for somebody to start a, a, a commercial development team in their Deeks residential firm, which was Circle L Solar. Um, and so I went and sat down with them, uh, we got a great vibe, uh, really felt like this was, and, uh, the team I wanted to work with and, and, uh, the spot I wanted to be and kind of turned out that, that Circle L, the, the, the residential firm didn't really want to dive that deep into commercial, um, understanding how long these sales cycles are and, and these dev cycle into sales cycle into uh, construction cycles they you know they're just really long processes and uh, so Deke and I were like uh, so I mean we had developed kind of a yin, yin and yang kind of uh, you know situation with one another and we work perfectly together and we're just like let's just go out and start our own so uh, not gonna lie, we opened an office less than a quarter mile away from Circle L, <laughs> and uh, just moved our uh, moved our laptops down the road a little yeah. bit, and uh, and then voila, there was uh, CLS Sustainable. But um, I think our I think our purpose with C, uh, with CLS one the uh, the residential game is 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 a pretty saturated uh, environment. Uh, and the CNI game was, was something that had just kind of, and especially in Texas, I mean, it was just starting to creep up. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, anytime that I dive into something, I, I want to, I want to be on the forefront. You know, I want to be an early adopter, and I want to um, get skin in the game before it becomes a convoluted mess. Um, that's really the only way that I think you can escalate yourself to to being on the top level of professionals in your field. So, nice. um, so <laughs> I mean, whether it was smart or, or not, uh, you know, at that point in time, we just dove straight in, and, and um, we uh, we caught some traction early, and. Um, quick quick traction for a, a typical CNI firm and um, you know through a couple of megawatts pretty quickly cash started flowing and um, we were we were trying to uh, <laughs> navigate that and then COVID hit and we were like you know all right well this gives us the time to at least step back and and organize processes procedures and and you know kind of revisualize exactly how we want to take this leap because in these industry, in this industry, if you you've got, you know, two guys in an office that can develop and oversee building a megawatt or two, yeah. But if you really want to step up into probably more than that, uh, you know, seven, eight, ten megawatts, and now you've got you've got to build a team. Yeah, you can't just be you. Yeah. So I mean, COVID gave us a. a the ability to step back and, and kind of evaluate where we wanted to take CLS, what the true vision was, instead of just such a rushed, frantic, set the table and go. And that's kind of where we came up with setting the table, is let's, let's 
get every relationship possible, put it on the table. Let's 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 make sure that we're prepared to take the next step. And uh, and yeah, so I mean, and then over the last year, we we've got our our manufacturers in place. We've got our direct contacts in place. We've got all of our installers all over the country in place. We've got our development partners in place. We've got our sales team up in Chicago in place. We've got everything in place now. Oh. And then over the last year, it's just kind of blossomed. So yeah. We're super excited. But. Sweet. Mm -hmm. Cool. So <clears throat> oh, you were already going into all of these components. So let's... Sorry, let's, I do that. I love yeah. it. <laughs> I love it. Let's, let's unpack mm -hmm. the components. So... Um, what is it like then for um, like a classical, uh, whether it's a school or a city, factory, etc., cetera, um, that wants to come on board CLS? What does that process look like? Um, so as of right now, so we've got, when we, we didn't want to oversee a bunch of salespeople um, just simply because that that's a, just a hectic nature coming in and out of our office. So what we decided we really wanted to do was set up a sales office or origination office. Um, sales in CNI and um, yeah, sales in CNI is, is, is extremely difficult. Um, and you have to have technicians. You can't just have closers and, and people that you know um, set people up on an emotional sale. You've got to have like really technical people that understand the development of this or you can mess up 25 years worth of financials for these people and, and make yourself look very bad very quickly so um, so what we wanted was originators and then from origination we would funnel into a, uh, a more organized and um, experienced dev team yeah. and then we would pass that through our process so Deke oversees the development side it would go through Deke's group and then get a signature and it comes over to my group for engineering construction and, and final build outs cool um, so yeah so as of right now we've got about 100 no what do we have 48 trained originators around the country Whoa. Uh, and yeah. then but we have a group that has um 124 or so commercial sales guys that uh, are beginning that training process. So yeah, yeah, should should bloom. Whoa, mm -hmm. sweet. Okay, so then the originators um, bit, like start off the relationship. With, right. Yep. So mm -hmm. then, um, then what does it look like then for them to begin getting funneled into Deke and his team, and then to get funneled into you and your team, and to actually get the install of the next gen technologies, how they pay it off over time. Yeah. Um, yeah, create that microgrid there, etc. Right. So they really just go out and seek people that are looking for solutions. Um, a myriad of different solutions, whatever we can offer. Um, but they, they know, if they walk into a school, they just ask, you know, what can we help with? <laughs> you know, on the energy side, what are your, what are your reasoning for, for, looking into this um, technology to begin with and once we figure that out now we can really design based on what they're looking for if it's financial if it's just environmental goals if it's a combination of both now we really understand what we're looking at and then we um, get all the relevant information energy bills energy contracts um, long-term interval data and um, drop that into the development bucket. Uh, from the development bucket, they'll do all of the analysis and, and initial designs from there. Um, the, uh, and try to get an understanding of different technologies that we can mesh uh, to, yep. uh, to make this work. Um, I think if, Deke was mentioning solar and CHP as kind of primary ones, right. right? Solar, CHP, obviously, um, um, ESS, uh, batteries and, and things of that nature. Uh, but, you know, we, we do send it to companies like GCE and things like that to analyze controls and HVAC and all of that as well. 
But, uh, but yeah, our bucket is typically going to consist of the three major components, either solar, CHP, or uh, ESS, or a combination of the three. And ESS stands for, again? Energy Storage Solutions. Energy Storage Solutions, mm -hmm. cool. So batteries. Yeah, batteries. Okay. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, okay, so then... Um, does the so it's really tailored like you said to the um to the actual client themselves and what their needs are um and then based on what their needs are then there's a design of what the next gen technologies would be like at their facility and right. then to make sure the financials would work out for energy generation um how much um uh, that they would actually pay less per month to then cover be covering the principle right. of the construction um so, so then, so let's yeah, let's keep exploring that the mechanism itself. Yeah, what and I, I, I think that's I think that's so important to our process is tailoring it to the client because so many companies will drop in and just say this is what we are good at, so this is what the solution is. But you really have so many options, um, and for especially on the financial side, uh, we can make things pencil in ways that straight solar can't by adding these other elements. Um, so yeah, it's, it's very, very important to us that we mold all of these solutions into something that fits each individual client. Yep. And then, so then the, the process, like, I like the idea of talking about it like a no-brainer and a win-win-win. So how how is it then that um, the school, muni, factory, etc. has a... Um, they're currently paying more for their energy bill mm -hmm. to a utility. Right. Then they have a specific... Um, does they have a desire for next gen technologies, whether it's financial, environmental, mix of both, etc. Mm -hmm. And then they're able to um, have you guys um, assist them with the transition, um, the EPC side of it, the financial side of it, all of all of that stuff. And they're able to then over time actually um, pay less money per month instead of to the utility. They're paying. Um, to or towards the principle of the next gen energy project that was constructed on their property. And so then it becomes a, um, a no brainer for them to make the transition and to then own the renewable technologies over time. Is that uh, Oh, sure. Yeah. We, we produce energy at a, at a cheaper rate than anyone on the planet right now in, in the solar field. We're, uh, Wow. Yeah, there's, there's, it's really not even much of a comparison. So, in most cases, um, and you know, we'll be completely upfront and honest. If it's not a feasible project, financially feasible project, if that's what it's all about is financials, then you know, you walk into a situation and you just say that's not going to be financially viable. Um, but. The idea is obviously to save significant money, not just you know pennies. You're you're looking at um, twenty five year projects, thirty year financials that uh, you know the, these modules are going to produce for the next twenty five to thirty years. They'll produce longer than that, but they're actually warranted to produce for thirty. So the uh, if your payback's eight years, six years, five years, four years, now you've got you know, the whatever 30 minus that payback year, you've got that worth of free energy. So it's, uh, and then if you're looking at long-term uh, payouts as, or long-term leases, long-term PPAs, things like that, then, you know, it's not going to be really financially viable if you don't save, you know, 10 to 15 percent off of your future energy bills. Yep. And uh, I think we can hit those numbers really easily. Um, average municipality or average school system is probably going to save around, you know, one point five to two million dollars uh, over the lifespan. Cool. So yeah. over the span of twenty five mm -hmm. or so years. Yeah. Wow. And that's in um, savings based on energy expenditure. Right. Cool. Mm -hmm. Wow. Cool. Um, 
and then they have the next gen technologies on the premises as well um, and it um, it creates an energy independence also which is nice absolutely yeah um, so there's not a reliance on drawing from the utility which is great right yeah so there's so many core components to this mm -hmm. um, this abundance of solar energy versus uh, a fossil fuel drawing from that right right <laughs> Yeah, the uh, the old adage is, you know, if if we ever stop drawing energy from the sun, we're all in much bigger much trouble. Better. Yeah, yeah. So it's <laughs> that's great. This is like the mm -hmm. um, the uh, in cosmology, there's like a Kardashev scale of like civilizations and how far advanced they become. Yeah, and uh, to hit sort of the first big threshold. Um, you have to uh, draw your energy from the local star, oh. right? Um, instead of from the local on Earth yeah. resources, right? And it makes sense. There's many futuristic ideas about Dyson spheres and all these other different types of technologies that can mm -hmm. harvest even more power from the sun. And whatnot. sure, yeah. you know, I mean, we're probably on the verge of some of that, but you know. yeah, it's cool because now we're like hitting a cosmological threshold of drawing energy from the sun, the star, instead of from the fossil fuels on the local right. local planet, which was important in the transition for the Industrial Revolution and all the stuff we went through. But now is the time mm -hmm. to make the transition to take, getting the power from the Because sun. the technology is there and the technology is, is cheap enough and the technology is understood. The, the, biggest, the, the biggest hurdle we have transitioning to renewable energy is is the the grid itself and and upgrades to the grid um ma massive upgrades are going to be required in order for us to interconnect enough of this to uh, to really make huge dents so i think i think upgrading our infrastructure next into um then installing many more solar panels as many as we possibly can mm -hmm. um but yeah, I think that that's the, I think that's definitely the next step. So I, I, that's a really cool uh, analogy. Yeah. So, what's the uh, efficiency up to now on photovoltaics? Is it like twenty five percent or something? Uh, I mean, you have certain modules hidden much higher than that. But yeah, I mean, anywhere from twenty two to twenty eight. Mm -hmm. And then potential to go up to forty five or something. Some. Theoretically. Suppose, theoretically, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And then supposedly some have started approaching, you know, that range. But Cool. Mm -hmm. Nice. Um, and then the... Um, so, it, so, for example, um, many of the, um, the solar installations typically end up happening in areas that get a lot more uh, frequency in sun. Right. So, um, have you have you guys noticed that um, there's a tremendous amount of increased uh, sales to CNI in the southern part of the United States versus the northern? Not really. Interesting. So, <clears throat> the the biggest driver on the CNI side is going to be supply rate electricity so in these southern states you, you're we're sitting here in Texas, Texas. a ton of um, pardon a ton of sun ton of natural gas ton of oil you've got lots of different energy sources and the uh, that drives down the cost of energy. So your average supply rate here in Texas is going to be somewhere in that 4.8 to, to 6.5 cents a, a kilowatt hour. But your average supply rate up in, say, the Northeast is going to be closer to 8.5 to, uh, you know, up to 11.5. Your average supply rate in California is going to be 15.5. Um, so interesting... So Texas, five cents approximately a kilowatt hour. Northeast, ten cents approximately a kilowatt hour. California, fifteen cents. Yeah, and in, in sheer supply rate. So that's the biggest driver. It's it's what what 
what's the avoided cost? So when we install in Texas, we've got to install at a very low price. Um, and then California obviously is typically much higher from a labor perspective, from a, you know equipment perspective. But you can still make it pencil a little bit better. Um, different states have different incentives. Um, Illinois has a massive incentive program that, that you can shave, you know, three to four years of payback off. Damn. You know? Yeah. And um, uh, same with Maryland, same with D.C., same with these other markets. So there are, there are lots of there are lots of variables. Um, when it comes to where to where to build, you know, and, and exactly the financial Interesting. feasibility. It's yeah. not just more, more sun yeah. equals more solar. Definitely not. That's cool. So the I so wish one of the yeah. one of the big variables is is uh, the incentive programs that are a part of those areas. Mm-hmm. That's a big one. Yeah. Incentives and avoided one. cost are mostly the biggest. Drivers. Avoided cost. Mm-hmm. What does that mean again? Uh, whatever the client is avoiding paying for electricity, so you're uh, if you're if you're paying five and a half cents or you're paying seven and a half cents, and we can come in and produce at four and a half. Oh, you've, sure. got a, you've got a three cent avoided cost. There. I see. Okay, so the delta of yeah. what they'll save right. per kilowatt hour mm-hmm. of it is avoided cost. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So, so big, that's the main drivers. thing. You guys want to prove? CLS wants to prove to the uh, to the prospective customer that the uh, amount per kilowatt hour is going to be a penny two three less as part of the right yeah right and you know CNI is such a different world you know a lot a lot people think emotionally about their homes and they 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 say you know you have a sales guy come in and be like it's gonna be a 10-year payback but then you'll have these on here for 20 years and you won't pay anything and they're just like they they start thinking about their home emotionally and, and can be driven into an emotional sale or an emotional close. Um, can't do that in C and I. You know you're going to be sitting in front of boards and you're going to go to the CFO and you've got to make financial sense in order for this to happen. So that is our responsibility first and foremost is to prove that this is a financially viable yeah. project. Um, that when it hits the CFO's desk, they're going to look at it and say, okay, we're going to. We're going to save X amount over the next X years and uh, and make it a, a financially feasible situation for them. So, yeah, that's the first thing we have to prove. Yep. Yeah, that's cool. That's a big difference. And then also there, um, there's something about like when you go for CNI projects, there's also a greater like the EPC itself has to scale tremendously because you're not just putting up... Um, I don't know how many average panels go up on a home. Um, 20? Um, yeah, so you're probably looking 20 to 30 in Texas. Um, yeah. And mm-hmm. then on a factory or school, I mean, what, 1,000, 2,000? Um, on a factory, um, probably closer to about 2,500. Yeah, maybe 3,000, um, depending on the size. Uh, schools... We're looking at probably fifteen hundred or so. That's so cool. And then um, wow, yeah. So like production facilities, stuff like that. Uh, but just like warehouses, you're looking at about twelve hundred. Yeah. Somewhere in that range. So yeah, a lot more. Cool. A lot more. It's a lot, there's a lot more juice flowing uh, up on that rooftop than uh, the typical house. So yeah. you've got to have some specialized, a specialized EPC and a skilled EPC to to pull it off. And so then over time, there's been like an accruing of um, the partners that can do these processes. Oh, goodness, yeah. That's what. That's why I'm the, the mention earlier of setting the table. Yeah, let's go to this. Yeah, we really didn't want to get into this uh, without a significant amount of, of backing from strategic partners <laughs> located all over the place. Yeah. Um, and highly skilled, knowledgeable partners. Um, shockingly, and, and not shockingly in some cases, but I mean, I 
I didn't think it was going to be this difficult to find them, uh, both from manufacturer direct contacts. You know, we we decided a long time ago that we we can't use distributorships to buy product and make this pencil for hardly anyone on, on the CNI side. So we we order you know manufacturer direct products now. We have manufacturer direct relationships and and setting that portion of the table just the procurement side was. Yes. Uh, was an absolute beating, and I uh, really thought it would be easier. But uh, so when we talk about the P in EPC, the P is the direct relationship with the manufacturer. The direct relationship with the manufacturer, yeah, our procurement relationships. Exactly. So um, you want to get the solar panels at as close to the cost where it's a win-win for the producer right. of it and for you guys to then be able to. Uh, sell to right. It's just like any other thing where you know you've got you've got a contractor that buys wholesale versus you going to Lowe's and buying your own plants or something. You know, it's great. like it's uh, it's just a significantly different, different price. price. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and making it and, a lot more plausible through that relationship that you've established with the procurement. Sure, because then it becomes easier for the school or the factory to come on board. Right, and I, I think it also just gives them a little more, more ease of mind that. Um, We've got enough skin in the game for manufacturers to deal with us directly. That's great. You know, yeah. Um, to so just say that is such a big deal. To <laughs> yeah, them. they're like, oh, you guys know the manufacturer directly. That yeah. means when your team's also serving, uh, servicing mm-hmm. over over the years, that if you have any questions, if your people have any questions, you talk directly to the manufacturer. The people that make, make these. it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it, does give, it does give a lot of peace of mind. And that was kind of an unexpected reward of setting the table with all these manufacturers. You know, we, we sit down in a boardroom and all of a sudden they're just like, oh, that's really impressive. You guys are doing directly to the manufacturer. And we had no idea that that was even going to be a, a reward that came from that. We, we just wanted to make sure we could get the cost down low enough to... To, to convince them that, to move forward uh, on the financial side. So, uh, but yeah, that's just one part, part of and then it. of the table. And then, like I said, the, where we got to this portion was the uh, construction side. Right. So let's hit that one. A now. shocking amount of people do not know how to build CNI solar. So it was a, uh, it, it was a lot of work to set up um, our strategic partnerships around the United States. Um, We went from market to market, um, and there were some swings and misses on our part with uh, certain partners, and, uh, you know, just kind of a scramble for a little bit. But, you know, we've we've got it to the point where we've got... uh, I think we've got 27 different uh, strategic partnerships in the United States. With uh, solid construction. Great construction. We've got um, we've cool. got two national construction firms that build some of our biggest bigger stuff uh, on the construction side. Um, and then, uh, like I said, we've got our, our crews around the nation uh, covering 35 states. That's big. Yeah, uh, yeah. Cool. and we we have a partnership in in Hawaii, but um, that that does some island work, Caribbean work, stuff like that. But we don't. We, we kind of just we don't. We're not active in those areas necessarily. Um, if something comes along, then we we send it over to them. But uh, so are yeah. you? So when you bring together the um, the E and the P, let's uh, the E P and the C. Mm-hmm. But when especially let's say the. Um, is, would you say that like Deke and his team on the table are doing the E side of it in terms of the designs? No. So they'll do preliminary designs. Preliminary designs. But cool. the, uh, once something goes to construction, then it comes to my desk and my team. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, so preliminary designs then to you and your team on construction, which then mm-hmm. you guys interface with the partners on the... Right. Okay, cool. Yeah, so, so all, all construction, engineering... Actually, all engineering, procurement, construction all comes into my, my, bu- my bucket. So then you're sourcing also through the manufacturer partnership. You would get the, let's say, 2,000 panels for a factory or school or whatnot. Mm-hmm. You would get them, and then you would have a preliminary uh, engineering and design visualization for the construction partner. Mm-hmm. And then the construct- 
would the construction partner also sort of like contribute to um, the sort of the field visit to know for certain that those designs are going to work in implementation and in construction? Right. And the design software that we use on, uh, you know, original, on um, the first designs, it's fairly accurate. We we just come in and, and clean things up. At that point, from what's the, uh, what's the software the that's used? Uh, so we use Aurora, which Aurora. is um, a cool. pretty well-known um, design software, and then we use Helioscope, which is probably the Sweet. most well-known. Sweet. Um, Sweet. But then, all the CAD drawings, all the you know permitting plans, all that stuff that that comes later. Uh, so okay. basically, what'll happen is we'll run all of our financial models and our production models off of. The helioscope or the Aurora layouts, then get through the client saying yes process, the financial paperwork, all of that. Uh, but as soon as we get a a uh, either an MOU or a, or you know some side of some sort of agreement, then it'll go into engineering on in my my side of the office basically. Um, cool. And then we'll just clean everything up. Uh, and make sure that everything's going to fit correctly. Make sure we don't have any kind of, uh, <laughs> yeah, make sure we don't have any, like, snafus with the fire department or, you know, the AHJs that, that, and permitting and all that. So we, uh, we deal with more of that, clean everything up, and then yeah. uh, we'll move into procurement around that same time, um, make sure that our... our Products are going to land inside of the, a week time or something like that. If we need a crane mm-hmm. to go up, if we need storage there, we, you know, coordinate all that, and then uh, coordinate with yeah. our uh, so cranes with our construction. Yeah. Yeah, 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 crane cranes are fun. Yeah, so you, so you, so, so sometimes you're um, the the best way, if not always the best way, to actually lift them um, up. So you would have to store them securely. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then you have to raise them to the roof, right? And typically, that's best with what storage containers uh, for the storage that are secure, and then mm-hmm. for raising them up um, is through the, just cranes that are maybe not the same ones that we see for the, <coughs> the big skyscrapers, but cranes that are kind of more like mini cranes, like hundred foot cranes, yeah, yeah, something like that, but or. hundred foot booms, and then they just drop down, but like uh, or sixty foot booms, but. Um, it doesn't always require a crane, but sometimes it does, and it's a little more coordination because wind and things of that nature. Yep. But uh, but typically, just a sky track is gonna load it up. But like we have a project down the road uh, going on that has a has a twelve foot parapet wall, so a really high mm. parapet wall, and we can't just put a sky lift over it and unload. So we have to get a crane and drop it down. So <laughs> it's a uh, but yeah, it's uh, it, it's never a dull moment on the construction side. Yeah, I mean, that's so for cool. Sure. I yeah. love that. Yeah, mm-hmm. <laughs> I love getting into. Um, I do too most of the time. Yeah, <laughs> most of the time. yeah. So it's cool. not it's not always uh, rainbows and unicorns. Unicorns, but, yeah, for sure. It's, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So the site visits are so important to make sure that all of the incredibly really important, incredibly yeah. important. So yeah, we'll get our strategic partners to go ahead and. Uh, do that, but under our terms, we have we have our intake forms that they need to f- send to us on on the site visit. And if there's anything on the structural side that that might be even remotely uh, iffy, then we'll send our structural yeah. to site to do a structural review. Cool. It's really it's really fun. Um, just feeling like you said this table. Um, mm-hmm. And how you guys, even after your first um, couple megawatt projects, that you still um, had to like take a step back and like analyze the table, um, and that in doing so you could set up all of these components in a greater um, with greater scalability um, and with greater relationships. Right. And now you said twenty seven uh, partners across. 35 states to your ability to be able to right construct that's really really cool trusted after several hit and misses too i like that too. <laughs> yeah because it does it does take that like adapt adaptive side 
That's, that's very biological. Also. Yeah, I mean construction. It it, it does, and but construction, especially this construction, uh, which is not a new commodity, but it's relatively unknown, relatively new. You know, there's you're gonna have to have thick skin and and learn how to fail and say I'm sorry on a couple of occasions and then just make it right. Yeah. Uh, and so we we had to go through that. Those growing pains were. Yeah. You know, prevalent, and and they they uh, weren't always the greatest of uh, of times. But no, I mean, I, I think it's I think it's good to have a. Um, I I think that has learned, earned us a lot of respect too, because we're really open with the fact that we we have not been, you know, uh, that we've been knocked down a couple of times. We had to find the right people uh, to do these jobs, and. Um, and now that we were there, it's uh, it makes my life a lot easier, a lot, uh, a lot less anxiety. Yeah. So, so then, what um, what is this like when uh, you have the procurement then of let's say um, two thousand or so panels, and then you have um, the construction of it? How give us an, also an idea of um, an a, approximate time scale for a project like that in it's like most let's say a- average but also it's increasing in its speed because of all of these pieces on the table becoming more optimized sure i mean at the end of the day uh some of these larger some of the mid mid-range you know megawatt megawatt's probably gonna take two three months to complete cool. um from the both the DC side, which is going to be your your just your racking, your uh, modules going down, and your strings being strung together on your modules, uh, and, and running that conduit up to the uh, inverters, which can be your AC side. Uh, there's a little more between the two. Yeah, typically about two to three months, somewhere in Whoa. there. Even yeah. just that bit like created a new little Cambrian explosion of interest. Uh, it's so cool, bro. So, um, <clears throat> by the way, is approximately a is approximately a megawatt of solar? Is there an approximate to how many panels that would equate to? Uh, right now, you're looking at probably you're looking at about twenty five hundred. Okay, twenty five hundred. Mm-hmm. Sweet. I mean, kind of on average with four hundred watt panels. So, I mean. Anywhere in that 2,000 to 2,500 range. And about 400 per panel. Watt. 400 watts, watts per, per panel. panel. Yeah. Okay. Generative. That's pretty good for yeah. per panel. Wow. Yeah. The, 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 first, the yeah. first solar panel I ever <laughs> oh, put on shit. a roof yeah. was, was 70 watts. Yeah. <laughs> so, and it, and it weighed... Um, it, it weighed a shitload. It did. And, um, <laughs> like, these panels are, like, half the weight and producing, you know six times the energy so damn yeah. that's so cool to hear about it because mm-hmm. we're only usually only focused on like moore's law and transistors and sometimes in biology we'll be taught about oh yeah well actually the speed at uh, sequencing is also decreasing and mm-hmm. the cost to sequence is decreasing um but hearing it in renewables is awesome yeah yeah, yeah. the uh the technology boom has just been kind of unbelievable to watch especially over the last several years these modules just just keep getting you know uh higher rating and higher ratings and uh i mean we've got 541 modules out there they're not uh typically ideal for cni um but yeah and it's it won't be long before you know we've got a a, like a single kw and inside of one module that's so yeah. cool yeah it's gonna be that's it's gonna great. be weird that's great yeah. bro mm-hmm. okay so um <clears throat> so it's interesting when you started sharing this so much began coming up as threats to pull on but so you have a to install a megawatt of solar you have about 2500 panels and then you have okay so the mounting goes up first you have all of this, mm-hmm. and it's usually, is it steel or what is the? Aluminum. Aluminum, because that's so much less in weight, right? Mm-hmm. right? Aluminum mounting, and then um, 
you have the panels that go on top of the aluminum mounting, but even before that, you run the actual, uh, all the wirings that are needed. Well, not until after. The, 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 the... You mount the panels first. Right. And then you do the wirings. Right. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, and so then the, sol the panels themselves are, are receiving DC locally, mm -hmm. and then that's then at an inverter is converted to AC right. into the school or the factory or whatever. Right. Mm -hmm. So then... Okay, so those are the primary, in a sense, components. Mounting, panels, taking the DC. Primary components, yes. racking, modules, inverters. Racking, your... modules, inverters. There it is. You yeah. heard it here. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah. I love it. We're, I, can, I can feel the sustainability ecosystem and the HomeDAO ecosystem learning about this, and it feels really good. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's a. Uh, I think we had touched on this earlier that uh, us being a part of the home DAO is. Uh, I'm going to have to learn a lot more about the home DAO ecosystem, and I'm hoping that we can, you know, uh, be available. And that's really what we want to do through this: is be available to to you know share our knowledge on on our expertise. And, and learn more about the the home dot ecosystem as well. So let's let's um let's play on this because I, this is a good transition into <laughs> it. So so then, um, what will it look like? Let's say um, with let's say the streamlining. Let's say that we really knock out um, the integration of Web three with uh, sustainability assets, mm -hmm. and then we just create a just a super facilitation of funding into um, the EPC scaling. So how would that affect CLS? Oh, I mean, tremendously. And, and on the EPC side, maybe not as much as the, the development side. The, uh, I mean, obviously they, they go hand in hand, but the... On the development side, yeah. Yeah, but our... Uh, the EPC is always going to be a part of the development, but they're going to deal with the financials a little bit more and try to trying to to find funds. Um, from you know, the majority of this is funded by private equity already, um, and the hoops and the red tape from private equity is. Uh, is something that is is uh, hindered. Um, the pri the 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 nonprofit uh, aspect of you know nonprofit entities, uh, schools, municipalities, things like that, things that uh, seem to be very very difficult to get through private equity. This is going to open up yeah. a lot more freedom. Cool. To bring extremely financially viable projects into uh, the home DAO, um, into the home DAO, but um, that are cost way too much to get into the uh, the private equity side. Private equity money is very very expensive, so mm. because that money is so expensive it really negates a lot of the positive financial viability of these projects. Uh, if you have this funding mechanism that, uh, that like HomeDAO, then um, now we've got access to easier, cheaper, free-flowing money yes. that doesn't have the red tape, that doesn't have the red flags, that doesn't have the high interest rates, that doesn't have all of that. Yeah. All of these things that hinder us from being able to make projects pencil and pencil well. Yeah. So. Oh, that's so cool. Now <laughs> I, I, I see this feel the streamlining uh, more. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think, you know, Deke, Andy, and I have talked about this a lot about just, I mean, if you, <laughs> we've always, you know, we've got several like home offices and things like that that we deal with that, that are always looking for projects, always looking for projects, always looking for projects but have, this is the IRR we need, this is how much this money is going to cost, all of that. We're viewing HomeDAO as a massive community home office. Yeah, that, that's cool. That the, the money isn't 
expensive. The money is free flowing. All we have to do is provide the oversight and the financial viability of these projects. And yeah. Oh, boom. that's so cool. So yeah, it, it's incredibly exciting on our side, and we're just one developer. Exactly. Yeah. Totally I mean, cool. as the like you say, the ecosystem starts to grow into other development firms and and people that see exactly what's happening here. It's uh, sky's the limit. Yeah. Cool. So there's with the existing um, old old money. There is there's a bit, the red tape, um, red flags. These things are, they inhibit and create friction in a sense with right. this process. And then the let's say the Web three and the tokenomics, um, the smart contracts, the blockchain model enables a f- more fluid, less red tapey. Um, as much as possible, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, frictionless uh, process for developers from all around the world to bring on, um, because you guys already have, if you want to say, the know-how. You have the know-how of installing the uh, the next-gen energy assets. Um, so you have the know-how of the who's interested and getting it done. And then just right. the funding mechanism itself is then... Yeah. Yeah, in what I would see, I would even add. You say who's interested and in, into the construction portion, but I would I would put in the middle there. I would be we knowing who's in, interested, mm. the ability to prove the value mm-hmm. of yes. it, and then build it and the, and um, the funding. Right, that's cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the viability. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we yeah. we were talking about that and visualizing it as vetting. Um, in a sense. The yeah. vetting process. Yeah, the yeah. vetting process is uh, exact. Interesting. Man, this is so good. Okay. Um, yeah, let's uh, let's come let's come to a close here soon. Okay. Um, yeah, and I'll be on again. So exactly. You know, you know, we, can, yeah. we can do another hour. Or so totally. Later. That this is this is the beauty of the Home Dow uh, podcast and ecosystem. Um, is that we have like the first round gets to cover a lot of the like the history and the existing um, the like CLS sustainable mm-hmm. and the, and then all that we're doing with HomeDAO uh, is still in its like kind of its nascent like stages of birthing the ecosystem so it's still oh, yeah. it's still a little like fresh and new but then when the second round drops it's going to be a lot more. Oh my gosh, we're actually have implemented this and this is succeeding. Yeah, that's the exciting part because we're going to move from background and getting to know one another, like, I, you know, we've just met. Um, but we're going to start moving into the growth phase of HomeDAO and the, uh, the analysis and the discussion of the future. And that's that's the exciting part. That's so, that's what I'm yeah. looking forward to. I don't I don't want to just sit around and talk about what we've done. Yeah. I want to talk about what, where we're going. Exactly. And what we're going to do. Yeah. And uh, so cool. yeah. So the future conversations will be directed towards that, and that's super exciting. And it's crazy because by that point there will have been um, already like potentially deployment across multiple chains. NFT drops. Mm-hmm. Um, people that actually have home tokens. Yeah. Um, uh, energy assets that are being built through the home DAO ecosystem, right? And that's the sky's the limit. Like, yeah. And I mean, like, the Americas and Africa and Europe and Asia all coming mm-hmm. online with this mechanism, yeah. and developers coming on board from those continents. Right. Um, that's cool. I know. We'll be doing this on stage and at seminars with token holders you know like that's, <laughs> that's so cool. that's the part that's awesome like so cool. what's happening is awesome you know the um we look back at what we've done in this industry and we still look at it as just you know grinding you know we're just this is the way we've chose this is the direction we've chose you know and, and to us it's not always work but technically it is it's our job and we don't look at it as anything special um we look at the future of what can happen with Home Down. And we're like, oh, that's that's special, and we we can't wait to start discussing, you know, more of that. But I'm o- looking forward to it. Almost like the 
the past um, where renewables began birthing and uh, fossil fuels sort of like ended up decreasing their um, kind of their their grasp on the energy systems um, that it was it was a little bit like it kind of had a little bit of roughness in a sense to the birthing of oh, the renewables. It was very rough. Uh, I was there. Yeah. I mean, in a lot of it, I was there. Like it was, it was incredibly rough. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, um, what's happened over the past 10 years in the renewable industry is, is, uh, is what any one of us that was in it 10 years ago the most we could have hoped for or dreamed for. Uh, if that was the direction we were taking our lives, if that's what we were dedicating our lives to, it was renewable energy. Ten years ago, we couldn't have scripted it much better. And it's cool because now, we did, we scripted it perfectly. This whole movie mm -hmm. of a universe is just so beautiful yeah. in the way it's expressing locally on Earth. Um, and then this other, the other component to that is as renewable sort of birth the models of how it would get executed is kind of still like the old central money model mm -hmm. of the execution of it right and now that also dies it's not kind of it is the, fully it is reliant right on, on that old, old yeah, money model, model. And, and now uh, the birth of the new web great. 3 money model it's mm -hmm. yeah yeah it, yeah, this is, and so we're here at the beginning of that one. You were there at the beginning of the Love first it. one. Yeah. I told you, I told you. Uh, we, we discussed that on, you know, 30 minutes ago or so. When I get into something, I want it to be at the forefront. Exactly. And, like, that's yeah. why we're so excited about what's happening here. Is that we're on the first wave. We're early adopters in this at yeah. this point. So, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, we're, we're really excited about it. Can't wait to come back on and, and discuss uh, more more of the future uh, than the past. But yeah, what a what a profound story though about the past and also about where we're going with all of this. Mm -hmm. I love it. This is this is why we do this. It acts like a magnet. Like this podcast is like a magnet for people to get involved in the ecosystem. Developers, people from Web three, right? All of the good stuff. Yeah, and they're like, "I want in because this is it." We're looking, at, looking forward to it. I, I agree. Yeah, so. Pe people have been looking for something that really, their heart is sort of screaming for something that serves people, planet, profit. Yeah, in essence, mm -hmm. and this is it. Like this is this is the thing. So, it is. Yeah, yeah, perfect. So. Kevin, thanks so much for coming on. No doubt. It's been a really cool first episode together. Love it. Yeah. Love it. Love it. Yeah. Thanks everyone for tuning in. We're super grateful for you guys watching. Um, you guys can find all the links in the bio below to clssustainable.com. Also, Kevin's LinkedIn if you want to reach out. All of the home DAO links, thehomedow.com. Our Twitter, YouTube, you can subscribe, follow there. Also, Discord as well if you want to join. Um, one of the best things you guys can do is actually share this video. If you guys found this video to be an awesome resource, informative, then take it and share it among on social networks with friends, family, etc. Um, let's get the word out there about HomeDAO. Um, and also, um, you can like the video. That helps the algorithm. You can subscribe to um, HomeDAO, also simulation if you would like the links down there. And that is all. We love you so much. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. And we're super grateful. Much love.